Inside the tower, it was like a war zone. Dark heat, pitch black, toxic smoke. But in the worst possible circumstances, London's firefighters did their best. I saw firefighters who I know are extremely fit. Marathon runners, completely fucked, throwing up. The fire floors we went in were helmet meltingly hot. I stood up on the 10th floor to smash a door in and instantly felt the heat on my head and shoulders. When I got down and removed my tunic, my shoulders were burnt. Firefighters have been banned from speaking to the media, but Newsnight has gathered anonymous first-hand accounts from those fighting the fire through an intermediary. We've also obtained the incident mobilisation list, the document which details when every London Fire Brigade appliance was sent and when it arrived. We pieced together a picture of the battle to fight the Grenfell fire and identified a series of failings that made a desperate task even tougher. Five minutes to one, two fire engines or pumps call signs G272 and G271 from G27, that's North Kensington Fire Station, get the call out. They're on scene in four minutes. Two more fire engines from Kensington and Hammersmith arrive shortly after. They've been called to a fridge fire on the fourth floor. What the firefighters on the inside couldn't see was what was happening on the outside. The firefighters went to the fire on the fourth floor and they were pretty confident they'd gone on top of it. And then something bad happens, something weird on their radios. They're hearing it's a four pump fire, that means there's four fire engines. Then it's a 10 pump fire, that's bad. Then it's a 20 pump fire, that's a catastrophe. And they don't get it because they're on top of the fire. And then they realise the fire is growing on the outside. Grenfell Tower on fire, fire brigade, everything. Look, wow, look. At quarter past one, five more appliances are called out from Paddington and Hammersmith. Fire spreading up. This footage, shot on a mobile phone, shows the fire hit the cladding and rage up the side of the tower. Firefighters try to tackle the blaze from the ground. 119, 24 minutes after the first crew is dispatched, the first high ladder or aerial call sign A213 is assigned to the fire from Paddington. It arrives at 1.32 a.m. If anything could have stopped the fire spreading to the outside, it might have been a high ladder and pump. So why weren't they sent immediately? The PDA is the predetermined attendance. That's what the Fire and Rescue Service plans for different locations if there is a call. Aerial appliances uh, were not on the original PDA. So in this case, there was some uh, half hour or so before the aerial appliance arrived. Um, whether that would have made a difference is something that needs to be looked at. Uh, I have spoken to aerial appliance operators in London who drive and operate those appliances and who attended that incident who think that uh, having that on the first attendance uh, might have made a difference because it allows you to operate a very powerful water tower from outside the building onto the building. Are you okay? By the time the high ladder arrived it was too late. The London Fire Brigade told Newsnight that the PDA has been changed after Grenfell so that an aerial appliance and an extra fire engine will now attend the fires in high-rise buildings. Inside, firefighters were battling the worst fire in Britain since the Second World War. The stairwells and tower blocks are supposed to be smoke-free. In Grenfell, the stairwell was yet another hazard. There was seriously heavy smoke locked floors between 3 and 14 early doors. Couldn't see a thing. The stairwells were smoke logged and full of casualties. Fighting a fire with toxic smoke, some of the Grenfell fire retardant was based on cyanide. It's like deep sea diving. The firefighters had 23 storeys to climb, but they had to keep enough air to get back down again. Very soon, far too soon, they were running out of air. A firefighter from North Ken brought a casualty down from the 21st and the guy was unconscious by the 19th. The firefighter dragged him down to the tent and ran out of air. He took his mask off and pegged it down. He collapsed as he came out. 
Crews were working on the stairs without breathing apparatus. They were sorting water and acting as runners. We took our masks off to put them on people and saw fuckloads of other people doing the same. More than an hour after the first crews were sent, the mobilisation list shows the fire chiefs on the ground called in every single extended breathing set in London, from places like Wandsworth, Islington and Tower Hamlets. In terms of uh, the, the compressed air breathing apparatus, the, um, clearly more would have been helpful. And again, we have to say this was an unprecedented fire. Um, so what became clear in this incident is that the extended duration sets were what was increasingly required uh, and more of those clearly would have helped. I think that raises questions about whether there should be a review of that. On the night of the fire, we're told, there was a big problem with water pressure. And if you're a firefighter, tackling an inferno, that's not good. There was total chaos beyond entry control. The fire floors we went in were helmet meltingly hot, and we only went in the lobbies initially. Later, when we were clearing flats, it was a case of a quick look in and close the doors because the water pressure wasn't up to the firefighting. Newsnight understands that the fire brigade asked Thames Water to boost the pressure. Even after that, we're told, the problems with water pressure continued. When approached by Newsnight, Thames Water would not comment directly on whether they were asked by the fire service to boost pressure. But they did issue this statement. We've been supporting the emergency services response in every way possible. Any suggestion there was low pressure or that Thames Water did not supply enough water to fire services during this appalling tragedy is categorically false. In thick smoke, in raging heat, something else went wrong too. Firefighters complained their radio communications weren't working properly. They weren't punching through 10 storeys or more of concrete and there was so much traffic on the airwaves they couldn't understand what was being said. Some of them weren't just fighting blind, they were fighting deaf too. The comms were so overcrowded I turned mine off. We couldn't get priority messages away and gave up trying. We were asked to withdraw several times but just ignored it because we were amongst it at that point. There's always been a problem in ship firefighters and high-rise buildings that anything above a certain amount of time, uh, floors, you, you have a problem with, uh, and we've always had a problem, when I was in the brigade, we always had a problem with, um, with the UHF radios, or handheld radios, and the Brindapolis radios, and I can imagine the amount of BA teams that are being put in there, each team would have given, been given its own call sign, like Zulu 1 or Zulu 2, etc., uh, and then you would have had one or two uh, breathing apparatus control officers trying to manage all of the messaging backwards and forwards. The firefighters spoke of the fire as a war zone, of ways of attack and retreat. By 4.30, crews from every part of London, Sutton, Ealing, Barking, Lewisham, had been mobilised. The scale of the response is unprecedented. The highest fire service aerial platform in Britain is not in London, but in Surrey. It arrived hours after the fire was out of control. So would a high platform have helped? The machine is at full stretch here. We're at 61 metres high, only a few metres off the full height of Grenfell Tower. The question is, had one of these machines, or something like it, been available from the get-go on that terrible night, would the story of the tragedy of Grenfell Fire ended quite differently? The London Fire Brigade told Newsnight the Commissioner has made her intention to fully review the Brigade's resources and seek funding for any additional requirements. The firefighters had been trained to fight the wrong kind of tower block fire and at the heart of this was the advice to residents to stay put until rescued. The controversy over stay put will continue to rage but with Grenfell Fire's death toll as high as it is the policy must surely be reviewed. One of the last residents to be rescued from Grenfell was at 6.30 in the morning. More than 200 people survived, but more than 80 people didn't. It's a truth worth retelling that firefighters rushed into harm's way that terrible night. They were heroes, no question. But was their kit up to scratch and did it arrive in a timely fashion? We won't know the full answers until the public inquiry 
but already it's safe to say that those in charge of keeping the capital safe from fire have serious questions to answer. There were failures, but London's dark monument also stands testament to extraordinary bravery against the odds too.